Okay, today we're going to be talking about comparison contrast. This unit is not in your textbook. Um, so you'll have to pay close attention to what we're talking about in class. One moment. OK, comparison contrast. So the basic idea of comparison contrast is that you have two things or more and you want to put them together. You want to compare, which means how are they similar? Or you want to contrast, which means how are they different? Uh, and there are two main ways to do this. Just like with exposition, just like with cause effect, you have an introduction, a body, and a conclusion. We'll talk about the introduction later. The conclusion is the same. After reading this essay, what can the reader do with this information? How has the reader been changed by reading this essay? You want to push your reader into the future. That's the conclusion. OK, so the body, how do you compare? There are two main strategies. The first way is one paragraph all about the first thing, and then the next paragraph all about the second thing. Uh, the other strategy is you first think about uh, the different aspects of each thing that you want to compare. Like uh, if you're comparing two classes, how are they similar? What, what points are similar? What points are different? Each point you would write one paragraph for. So for example, your first paragraph could be about the different teaching styles of the professors. The second point can be about the different kinds of things you learn. The third point could be about the different atmospheres in the classroom. Right? Each point would have its own paragraph. Uh, and in every paragraph, you would talk about both classes or both things. Uh, it is a comparison and contrast. So if you choose the first strategy, one big paragraph about the first thing, another big paragraph about the second thing, you still have to remember that you are going to compare two things. So especially when you write that second paragraph, you should try to link each point back to the first paragraph. OK, so we've talked about the conclusion. We've talked about the body. Introduction. The introduction should tell the reader why these two things should be compared. Why are you putting them together? In other words, why are you writing this essay? Uh, the most common reason is uh, you want to help the reader choose between two things. This car or that car. Uh, this pen or that pen. This boyfriend or that boyfriend. Right. Another re uh, common reason is that you want to tell the reader that these two things may look similar, but in fact they're very different. These two teachers share a lot of similarities, but if you really think about it, they are quite different people. Another reason is uh, you want to introduce something new. And so you take something familiar and compare it to the new thing to help your reader understand this new thing. So there, uh, there are different reasons. Uh, why you would want to write an essay putting together two things. And you should let your reader know what your reason is in the introduction. 
OK, so that's the theory part. Do you have questions? Try to write about something that you care about, or I guess write about two things that you care about. Uh, I know some of you um, like to go online to look for essay topics. That's fine. But when I read that kind of essay, it's kind of boring, right? Like I know about those essay topics. Uh, people have written about them before. And I will still mark them and I will still give you feedback. But I feel like it, in some ways it's kind of a, a pity, yurinkoshi, right? You're not practicing on something that you really care about. You're not um, giving your own deepest, most passionate thoughts about that topic. So I always encourage people to write about something that you really do care about and you do want to share with the reader. OK, so now that we know what a comparison contrast essay is and how to write it, let's take a look at some examples. Uh, this PDF has four essays. Let's see if we can talk about all four of them. First one, Conversational Ball Games by uh, Nancy Masterson Sakamoto. Uh, so the introduction tells you this is an essay comparing Japanese and American conversation styles. After I was married and had lived in Japan for a while, so the author is not from Japan, right? So it's probable that she's from America. I had lived in Japan for a while. My Japanese gradually improved to the point where I could take part in simple conversations with my husband, his friends, and his family. And I began to notice that often, when I joined in, the others would look startled and the conversational topic would come to a halt. So something about the way she joins the conversation is very surprising and people don't know how to react to her. After this happened several times, it became clear to me that I was doing something wrong. But for a long time, I didn't know what it was. So from this introduction, we already understand that the reason the author is comparing Japanese and American conversation styles is to try to figure out what is the Japanese conversation style? What is she doing wrong? Finally, after listening carefully to many Japanese conversations, I discovered what my problem was. Even though I was speaking Japanese, I was handling the conversation in a Western way. So this is the topic of the essay. What is the Japanese way? What is the Western way of having a conversation? Japanese style conversations develop quite differently from Western style conversations. And the difference isn't only in the languages. I realized that just as I kept trying to hold Western style conversations, even when I was speaking Japanese, so my English students kept trying to hold Japanese style conversations, even when they were speaking English. Uh, notice this grammar here. Just as A, so B. Right, so these two are the same uh, kinds of situation. In Chinese, we would call this 就像,然后什么什么一样, uh, 同样的, so. We were unconsciously playing entirely different conversational ball games. Okay, so this is the 
key image or I guess key argument of this essay that you can think of conversation styles like you're playing a ball game. It's on Chole Ring Dong. A Western style conversation between two people is like a game of tennis. OK, so we're starting with Western style. Why? Because the purpose of this essay is to figure out what is the Japanese style. So we start from something familiar to the author. And by comparing this familiar thing to a new thing, we can better understand the new thing. So we're starting from the familiar. A Western style is like a game of tennis, Wang Chou. If I introduce a topic, a conversational ball, I expect you to hit it back. If you agree with me, I don't expect you simply to agree and do nothing more. I expect you to add something, a reason for agreeing, another example, or an elaboration to carry the idea further. But I don't always, uh, I don't expect you always to agree. I am just as happy if you question me or challenge me or completely disagree with me. Whether you agree or disagree, your response will return the ball to me. And then it is my turn again. I don't serve a new ball from my original starting line. I hit your ball back again from where it has bounced. I carry your idea further or answer your questions or objections or challenge or question you. And so the ball goes back and forth with each of us doing our best to give it a new twist, an original spin or a powerful smash. So this image is quite clear, right? Western style conversation is not just uh, one person talking. Both people have to contribute to the conversation. So it looks like the style of this essay will be first one section on the first thing and then another section on the second thing. So we're going very deep into the first thing. And the more vigorous the action, the more interesting and exciting the game. Of course, if one of us gets angry, it spoils the conversation, just as it spoils a tennis game. But getting excited is not at all the same as getting angry. After all, we're not trying to hit each other, we're trying to hit the ball. So long as we attack only each other's opinions and do not attack each other personally, we don't expect anyone to get hurt. A good conversation is supposed to be interesting and exciting. So this is also an important idea in her comparison. The difference between being excited and being angry. Both of these emotions can seem very similar, but according to the author, being excited is hitting the ball, like focusing on the conversation topic. Only when you try to hit each other, when you start to attack the person, not the idea, but the person, only then is this getting angry. So this is the limit of the Western style conversation. You can say, basically whatever you want about the topic, but not about the person. If there are more than two people in the conversation, then it is like doubles in tennis, shuangda, or like volleyball, paicho. There's no waiting in line. Whoever is nearest and quickest hits the ball, and if you step back, someone else will hit it. No one stops the game to give you a turn. You're responsible for taking your own turn. But whether it's two players or a group, everyone does his best to keep the ball going 
and no one person has the ball for very long. Uh, you may have heard that if you go to school in the United States, uh, you have to fight for the chance to talk in class. And this is a good description of that process. Nobody will hold the ball for you. Nobody will wait for you. You have to go grab the ball. Uh, so in general, I think this is a pretty uh, clear description of a Western style conversation. And the point is to keep the ball going. The point is to continue the conversation. So that's the first thing, Western style conversation. Now let's look at the second thing, a Japanese style conversation, however, is not at all like tennis or volleyball. It's like bowling, bowling cho. You wait for your turn. And you always know your place in line. It depends on such things as whether you are older or younger, a close friend or a relative stranger to the previous speaker, in a senior or junior position, and so on. OK, so the first difference that the author mentions is that instead of fighting for the ball, you have to wait for your turn and your turn is. Uh, it depends on your. Relation to the previous speaker. So it's still a social interaction, but you should always remember what your relationship is with the other people in the conversation. Already, this is a big difference in the Western style conversation. It said as long as you don't attack the person, you can say anything you want about the topic. But here, the first point the author mentions about the Japanese style conversation is you have to remember the people in the conversation. When your turn comes, you step up to the starting line with your bowling ball and carefully bowl it. Everyone else stands back and watches politely, murmuring encouragement. Everyone waits until the ball has reached the end of the alley and watches to see if it knocks down all the pins or only some of them or none of them. There's a pause while everyone registers your score. Then, after everyone is sure that you have completely finished your turn, the next person in line steps up to the same starting line with a different ball. He doesn't return your ball, and he does not begin from where your ball stopped. There's no back and forth at all. All the balls run parallel, and there's always a suitable pause between turns. There's no rush, no excitement, no scramble for the ball. Okay, bang guan home, ma. So notice that the author describes her understanding of a Japanese style uh, conversation, but then she remembers to compare it to the first point. Right, there's no rush, no excitement. This is comparing the Japanese style conversation with the Western style conversation. Uh, so now we have a deep understanding or deeper understanding of both styles of conversation, and they look quite different. So this is the paragraph 12 is where the author puts these two together. No wonder everyone looked startled when I took part in Japanese conversations. I paid no attention to whose turn it was and kept snatching the ball halfway down the alley and throwing it back at the bowler. Of course, the conversation died. I was playing the wrong game. So this paragraph is 
the author using a Western style to join a Japanese conversation. The next paragraph is about Japanese people using a Japanese style to join a Western conversation. This explains why it is almost impossible to get a Western style conversation or discussion going with English students in Japan. I used to think that the problem was their lack of English language ability. But I finally came to realize that the biggest problem is that they too are playing the wrong game. Whenever I serve a volleyball, everyone just stands back and watches it fall with occasional murmurs of encouragement. No one hits it back. Everyone waits until I call on someone to, to take a turn. And when that person speaks, he doesn't hit my ball back. He serves a new ball. Again, everyone just watches it fall. So I call on someone else. This person does not refer to what the previous speaker has said. He also serves a new ball. Nobody seems to have paid any attention to what anyone else has said. Everyone begins again from the same starting line and all the balls run parallel. There's never any back and forth. Everyone is trying to bowl with a volleyball. So these few paragraphs do a good job of explaining this common situation. Uh, I'm sure you uh, have also experienced something similar uh, in an English class or a language class when the teacher tries to start a conversation. Few students are willing to join that conversation. And according to the author, it's because there are two different ideas of what a conversation should be. So paragraph 16 and 17 are the conclusion. Now that you know about the difference in the conversational ball games, you may think that all your troubles are over. Right, so this sentence pushes the view uh, the reader into the future. Now that you have this knowledge, do you think you're ready? Not yet. But if you have been trained all your life to play one game, it is no simple matter to switch to another, even if you know the rules. Knowing the rules is not at all the same thing as playing the game. So how does the author push the reader into the future? By telling the reader, knowledge is just the first step. You also have to practice. Even now, during a conversation in Japanese, I will notice a startled reaction and belatedly realize that once again, I have rudely interrupted by instinctively trying to hit back the other person's bowling ball. And the, the footnote tells us belatedly means too late. So only after it happens. It is no easier for me to just listen during a conversation than it is for my Japanese students to just relax when speaking with foreigners. Now I can truly sympathize with how hard they must find it to carry on a Western style conversation. So it turns out that the uh, what the author wants the reader to take away is not uh, now you can have great Japanese conversations. Instead, the point is to help the reader sympathize with people playing different conversational ball games. So even if uh, you cannot or do not want to change how other people talk and have a conversation, you at least understand why they are doing this. So the structure of this essay is a typical comparison contrast essay. First introduction tells us the point why 
the author is writing this essay, and the reason is to find out uh, why she's having trouble talking with Japanese people. Uh, paragraph two gives us the main idea. Difference between Japanese style and Western style conversations. The third paragraph gives us the main argument or the main image. And it is by comparing these two styles of conversation with playing sports, playing ball games. Paragraphs four to seven are, sorry, four to eight are about the Western style conversation. And then paragraphs nine to 11 are about the Japanese style. Starting from the last line of paragraph 11. And then including paragraph 12, this is. Uh, paragraph 12 and paragraph 13. This is the comparison part, putting these two together. Uh, and then paragraph 14 and 15 is also this comparison. So 12, 13, 14, 15 are putting these two things together. And then paragraph 16 and 17 are the conclusion. Uh, 16 tells us that the conclusion is not uh, go out and have great conversations. The real conclusion in 17 is to understand what, why other people are doing this. OK, do you have questions about this, this essay? If not, let's move on to the next essay. Home Ground Schoolyard, A Double Life by Daria Muse. Already this title screams out. It's a comparison essay, right? Double life, two different kinds of life. Uh, so this essay is about the author who is a black woman. When she was younger, she was sent to a school with mostly white students. So she behaved differently at school and at home. And this essay is about these two kinds of lifestyles. During my elementary and middle school years, I was a well-behaved, friendly student at school and a tough, hard-nosed bad girl in my neighborhood. So the very first sentence gives us the main idea of this essay. She behaved one way at school and a completely different way in her neighborhood at home. This contrast in behavior was a survival tool, for I lived in a part of South Central Los Angeles where goody goodies aren't tolerated. And I attended school in Northridge where troublemakers aren't tolerated. So her two living situations, one at school, one at home, are completely the opposite. At home, she has to be like a troublemaker, but at school, she has to be a good student. Beckford Avenue Elementary School was in the heart of middle class suburbia. And I, coming from what has been described as the urban jungle, was bused there every day for six years. So the author lived in the middle of the city, urban jungle, but she went to school in middle class suburbia. Uh, and so in fact, she was bused to school, which means that she took a special bus that went across school district lines. That it was a privilege for kids like us to be bused to a good school like Beckford was drummed into our heads by our teachers and principal so as to induce us, the bus kids, into behaving like the young ladies and gentlemen they wanted us to be instead of the uncontrollable delinquents they thought we were. 
So every day, her teachers and principal would repeat that it was such a privilege, she is on uh, for these kids to be able to go to school at Beckford. And they did this to try to turn these kids, the so-called bus kids who came here on a bus, into the proper young ladies and gentlemen that the school wanted them to be. Whereas the teachers usually just thought of them as uncontrollable delinquents. Delinquents in Chinese is 不良少年. This is a great sentence. I love this sentence. Like, look at the structure of this sentence. This is the subject. This is 主持. And you can tell that it's the subject because it begins with the word that. When you see the word that, it introduces a complete sentence used as a noun. So this is a complete sentence, and it is used as a noun as the subject of this sentence. This is the verb. I guess we should say this is the verb. It was drummed into our heads. It repeated every day in order for us to remember it. And the reason, so as to, is to induce us into behaving differently. They kept doing this in order to make us into some different kind of person. And this different kind of person is, there's a relative cause here, this is Guan Dai, that they wanted us to be, instead of comparison, the delinquents that they thought we were. So this is parallelism, you didn't pipe right? They want us to be one thing, but they think that we are another thing. This is also a relative clause that they thought we were. It's a beautiful sentence. I love this sentence. In a roundabout way, which means indirect, I was told from the first day of school that if I wanted to continue my privileged attendance in the hallowed classrooms of Beckford, hallowed here means sacred, I would have to conform and adapt to their standards. I guess I began to believe all that they said because slowly I began to conform. So after the first paragraph introduces the topic, the second paragraph gives us the background to the story. Why did the author end up becoming a different person at school? Because that comparison between her uh, family life and, and her school life, that comparison was made by her teachers and principal. The school itself told her to become a different person. The teachers themselves made this comparison, right? Telling them that it's a privilege to come here, at the same time calling them bus kids. So uh, it's no wonder that the author ended up becoming a different person at school. This is what the environment wanted from her. Right, it says, the, the school told me I would have to conform, therefore, Slowly, I began to conform. Instead of wearing the tight jeans and t-shirt that were the style in South Central at the time, I wore schoolgirl dresses like those of my female classmates. I even changed my language. When asking a question, instead of saying, Boy, give me those scissors before I knock you up your head. In school, I asked, excuse me, would you please hand me the scissors? When giving a compliment in school, I'd say, you look very nice today. Instead of, girl, who do you think you are dressing so fine, Miss Thang? So this essay apparently is comparing point by point. Every paragraph, is about a certain kind of situation, 
and it's comparing the uh, situation from her home life and from her school life. So paragraph three is about the way that she dressed and the way that she talked. Uh, do you guys need me to translate black English? Hey, and Liu, you can't Uh I knock you up your head means before I hit you. So in Chinese, this would be uh, uh, and this means uh, why are you dressed so well like you're something special? In Chinese would be uh, This confirmation of my appearance and speech won me the acceptance of my proper classmates at Beckford Ave uh, Avenue Elementary School. But after getting out of the school bus and stepping onto the sidewalks of South Central, my appearance quit being an asset and became a dangerous liability. Uh, so asset is something worth money and liability is something you owe someone else. Asset is liability liability. Um, so here it is. Here she's making the comparison She's transitioning from school to home. What was proper for school was dangerous in her own neighborhood. One day when I got off the school bus, a group of tough girls who looked as though they were part of a gang approached me, looked at my pink and white lace dress. And accused me of trying to look white. Which is kind of true, right? She is trying to look white. They surrounded me and demanded a response that would prove to them that I was still loyal to my black heritage, which here heritage means culture. I screamed, lay off me girls or I'll bust you in the eyes so bad that you'll need a telescope just to see. Uh, which means that if you don't stop, I will hit you. The girls walked away without causing any more trouble. So this paragraph gives us the contrast between the two cultures, and it also shows us that even though at school the author behaves properly, when she gets home she can still behave as her neighborhood wants her to. From then on, two personalities emerged. I began living a double life. At school, I was prim and proper in appearance and in speech, but during the drive on the school bus from Northridge to South Central, my other personality emerged. Once I got off the bus, I put a black jacket over my dress. I hardened my face and roughened my speech to show everyone who looked my way that I was not a girl to be messed with. I led this double life throughout my six years of elementary school. So from paragraph four to paragraph five, uh, paragraph four, she is in danger, but she proves that she can still um, maintain her identity and belonging in her community. In paragraph five, she learns how to make give that appearance uh, in order to avoid danger. Now that I'm older and can look back at that time objectively, I don't regret displaying contrasting behavior in the two different environments. It was for my survival. So this conclusion answers a question that the reader might have, which is, how do you feel about your behavior today? 
do you think that it's a bad thing? And she says, no, I had to do it to survive. Daria, the hard nosed bad girl, survived in the urban jungle and Daria, the well behaved student, survived in the suburbs. As a teenager in high school, I still displayed different personalities. <laughs> so she's a she's currently in high school. OK, I still display different personalities. I act one way in school, which is different from the way I act with my parents, which is different from the way I act with my friends, which is different from the way I act in religious services. So when she's at church. But don't we all? We all put on character masks for our different roles in life. All people are guilty of acting differently at work than at play and differently with coworkers than with the boss. There's nothing wrong with having different personalities to fit different situations. The trick or the key is knowing the real you from the characters. So in the conclusion, she doesn't just say that she had to do this for survival. She goes on to say that this is perfectly normal. Everyone does something like this. In different situations, we, pre uh, we present different sides of ourselves. It may not be as extreme or exaggerated as the author's childhood, but we all do something similar. So there's no reason for her to feel bad about this. So in this essay, the first paragraph introduces the topic. The second paragraph explains why there is this difference. Um, so this essay is trying to explain why two things that seem very similar are in fact very different. Right? It's the same person, and yet the author behaves very differently at school and at home. And this essay is trying to explain that difference. So the second paragraph explains how that difference started, why she began behaving differently at school. The third paragraph gives some of those differences in clothing and behavior and uh, language, what she says. Paragraph four tells us what happens when she uh, uses the wrong behavior in the wrong place. And so paragraph five tells us how she learned to change from one person to another when she changed locations. Paragraph six looks back on this situation and tells the reader that it may, it may seem strange, but in fact it's normal for everyone. So what does the author want the reader to take away from this essay? How is the author pushing the reader into the future? She's telling the reader that to look at your own life and see if you also do these things. Okay, do you have questions about this essay? Okay, uh, there are two slightly shorter essays later in this chapter. Let's see. OK, this one, my two brothers. Let's take a short break and when we come back, we'll look at this essay.
好，刚刚收到二十篇作文，班上有三十个人，所以如果你们还没交的话，我晚一点会写全班信跟你们讲辞交程序，也会贴在 Teams 上面。OK， let's look at this essay。呃，可以帮我关一下后门吗？My two brothers, again a title that calls out for comparison. No two people are exactly alike, and my two older brothers, Nan and Hung, are no exceptions. When I think of them, I think of Rudyard Kipling's words. 帮我关后门。帮我关后门。谢谢。When I think of them, I think of Rudyard Kipling's words: "East is east, and west is west, and never the twain shall meet." Uh, Kipling, Ji Boling, is a poet, and the word "twain" here just means two. So it looks like this essay will be about how different the author's two brothers are. Even though they have the same parents, there are considerable differences in looks, personality, and attitude toward life. Reflect the differences between Eastern and Western cultures. So this sentence tells us that the essay will talk about their appearance, their personality, and their attitude toward life, and that somehow these differences. Will be very similar to differences between East and West. Like the majority of Asian men, Nan is short, small, and has a full moon-shaped face. His smooth white skin and small arms and feet make him look somewhat delicate and jingzhi. Nan always likes to wear formal, traditional clothes. For example, on great holidays or at family rite celebrations, rite is ritual, 仪式 Nan appears in the traditional black gown, white pants, and black silky headband, all of which make him look like an early 20th century intellectual. So Nan dresses in a more traditional way. In contrast to Nan, Hung, who is his younger brother by ten years, looks more like an American boxer, Chen Jisou. He is tall, muscular, and big boned. Muscular means has a lot of muscles. He is built straight as an arrow. And his face is long and angular as a Western character. Unlike Nan, so we we're getting a comparison, right? Unlike Nan, Hung has strong feet and arms, and whereas Nan has smooth skin, Hung's shoulders and chest are hairy, large, and full. Unlike Nan too, Hung likes to wear comfortable T-shirts and jeans or sports clothes. At a formal occasion, instead of wearing traditional formal clothes, Hung wears stylish Western-style suits. So, paragraphs three and four about the first point: appearance. Nan is more Asian, and his younger brother Hung is more Western. So, the essay told us there are three points, right? Looks, personality, attitude. So it looks like the next one will, the next two paragraphs will be about personality. Nan and、uh, Nan and Hung also differ in personality. I don't know how my father selected their names correctly to reflect their personalities. Nan's name means patience, and his patience is shown in his smile. He has the smile of an ancient Chinese philosopher that Western people can never understand. He always smiles. He smiles because he wants to make the other person happy, or to make himself happy. 
He smiles whenever people speak to him, regardless of whether they are right or wrong. He smiles when he forgives people who have wronged him. Nan likes books, of course, and literature and philosophy. He likes to walk in the moonlight to think. Nan also enjoys drinking hot tea and singing verses. In short, in our family, Nan is the son who provides a good example of filial piety and tolerance. Filial piety is Xiao Dao. Hung, on the other hand, does not set a good example of traditional respectful behavior for his brothers and sisters. His name means strength, but his strength is self-centered. As a result, unlike Nan, Hung only smiles when he is happy. When he talks to people, he looks at their faces. Because of this, my eldest brother Nan considers him very impolite. As one might expect, Hung does not like philosophy and literature. Instead, he studies science and technology. Whereas Nan enjoys tea and classical verses, Hung prefers to sunbathe, yu guang yu, and drink Coca-Cola while he listens to rock and roll music. And like many American youths, Hung is independent. In fact, he loves his independence more than he loves his family. He wants to move out of our house and live in an apartment by himself. He is such an individualist that all the members of my family say that he is very selfish. So that's the two brothers' personalities. And it, so I guess the next two paragraphs will be about their attitude toward life. So this essay is taking a point by point contrast, each point telling us how the two brothers are different. My brother's differences do not end with their looks and personalities. Concerning their attitudes toward life, they are as different as the moon and the sun. My eldest brother Nan is concerned with spiritual values. He is affected by Confucian, Taoist, and Buddhist theories. Uh, Taoist is Dao Jia. These theories suggest that the human life is not happy. Therefore, if a man wants to be happy, he should get out of the competitiveness of life and should not depend on material objects. For example, if a man is not anxious to have a new model car, he does not have to worry about how to make money to buy one. And if he does not have a car, he does not have to worry about the cost of gas. My oldest brother is deeply affected by these theories, so he never tries hard to make money to buy conveniences. In contrast to Nan, my brother Hung believes that science and technology serve human beings and that the West defeated the East because the West was further advanced in these fields. Therefore, each person must compete with nature and with other people in the world in order to acquire different conveniences, such as cars, washing machines, and television sets. Hung is affected by the Western theories of real values. Consequently, he always works hard to make his own money to satisfy his material needs. I want to point out that this example is very carefully chosen. Uh, so for Hung, there are like cars, washing machines, television sets, three different examples. But for none, the only example is a car. But this example is chosen very carefully because this is also the first example uh, for the paragraph on Hung. So by making this one the first example, it reminds us about what Nan thinks about cars. Same object, different attitudes, creates a strong contrast. So we have gone through the three points. We have talked about each brother's difference. 
now the conclusion. What does the author want us to take away from this essay? In accordance with the morality of the culture of my country, I cannot say which one of my brothers is wrong or right. This is very interesting. The author cannot say who is right, who is wrong, but not because they don't know. It's because of the morality of my culture. If I follow my traditional culture, I can't tell you that one brother is better than the other. But I do know that they were both want to improve and maintain human life on this earth. I am very lucky to inherit both sources of thought from my two older brothers. So it seems like the ending message is that the author is very lucky because the author gets to see and experience both cultures through the two brothers. The idea that you get to see both at the same time is a kind of good fortune. But I do think that this ending sentence in accordance with the morality of my culture, I think that puts him on the side of none and Eastern culture. Because even here, the author is following the, their own culture instead of the Western culture. So uh, again, a very good structure in this essay. First paragraph uh, points out the two brothers that are going to be compared. The second paragraph tells us what the rest of the essay will talk about, the three main points. Paragraphs three and four talk about the first point, always non-first hung second. Five and six are about the second point. Seven and eight are about the third point. Always non-first, hung second. And when talking about hung, the author always compares him back to none. Right, he, he hung on the other hand. Uh, and then unlike none. So the second paragraph for each point always makes this comparison. And then paragraph nine is the conclusion, which says that it is better to have both brothers because it offers the author two different perspectives. OK, do you have questions about this essay? OK, so there's one more essay and then let's do some grammar practice, something for you to look forward to. My old neighborhood. If you think about it, this title is also a very comparative title. My old neighborhood. So there are, are already two possible essays the author could write here. Maybe it's comparing the old neighborhood to the new neighborhood. I like maybe the author moved away, right? So now the author is living somewhere else and the essay is comparing these two places. Or maybe the author has, is living in the same place or like came back to the same place many years later, and the essay is comparing the same place before and now. But either way, this title screams out for a comparison. Several years ago, I returned to Washington, D.C., and visited one of my old neighborhoods. Aha, so this is the second kind of essay. The author, after many years, comes back uh, and compares the neighborhood before and the neighborhood now. I had not been on Nash Street for more than 20 years. Wow, so it's 20 years later. And as I walked along the street, my mind was flooded by waves of nostalgia, Huaijiu. I saw the old apartment building where I had lived and the playground where I had played. As I viewed these once familiar surroundings, images of myself as a child there came to mind. However, 
what I saw and what I remembered were not the same. I sadly realized that the best memories are those left undisturbed. So the comparison is between what the author saw and what the author remembered. And uh, it already gives us the conclusion here. The best memories are left undisturbed. As I remember my old apartment building, so the first paragraph will be about the building. Right, sorry, the second paragraph will be about the building. It was bright and alive. When I was a child, the apartment building was more than just a place to live. It was a medieval castle, a pirate's den, a space station, or whatever my young mind could imagine. I would steal away with my friends and play in the basement. This was always exciting because it was so cool and dark. Cool here does not mean, oh, it's so cool. Cool here means kind of cold. The basement was so cool and dark, and there were so many things there to hide among. Our favorite place to play was the coal bin. Fang tan de so like this was a long time ago, right? When houses had to burn coal for energy. We would always use it as our rocket ship because the coal chute could be used as an escape hatch out of the basement into outer space. Chute uh, is a tongguan. So like in older houses that have to burn coal, you would put the coal in the basement, uh, and when you needed it, you would send it through the chute up into the house. That's not right. Uh, and when you needed to add coal, you could use the chute to send a new coal down into the basement. So paragraph two is about the apartment that the author remembers. So paragraph three is probably about the apartment that the author sees today. All of my memories were not confined to the apartment building, however. Ah, so I was wrong. So it looks like this essay will be about memory first and then uh, the reality today second. So we're continuing with the memories. Not confined to the apartment building. I have memories of many adventures outside of the building also. My mother restricted how far we could go from the apartment building, but this placed no restrictions on our exploring instinct. There was a small branch in back of the building where my friends and I would play. And it says here branch means a stream or small river, Xiaoxiliu. In back of means behind. We enjoyed it there because honeysuckles grew there. We would go there to lie in the shade and suck the sweet smelling honeysuckles. Honeysuckles are a kind of a flower. Uh, I'm not very good with flowers and plants. If you want to know what it is, uh, you can look it up yourself. Our biggest thrill in the branch was the day the police caught an alligator there. I did not see the alligator and I was not there when they caught it, but just the thought of an alligator in the branch was very exciting. This is how I remembered the old neighborhood. However, as I said, this is not how it was when I saw it again. So paragraph four, is a transition paragraph. It brings us from the past to the present, from the author's memory to what he or what the author sees uh, upon returning after 20 years. Honeysuckle is Jing Yinghua. Picture, okay. Unlike, comparing, unlike the apartment building I remembered, 
This one was now run down and in disrepair. Lao Zhou. Disrepair means it needs repair. What was once more than a place to live looked hardly worth living in. Uh, the court, so like the middle empty part, was dirty and broken up, and the windows of the building were all broken out. The once clean walls were covered with graffiti and other stains. Graffiti is when you paint on the wall. There were no medieval knights or pirates running around the place now, nor spacemen. Instead, there were a few tough-looking adolescents who looked much older than their ages. Adolescent, Qing Saonian. As for the area where I used to play, it was hardly recognizable. But it was hardly recognizable. The branch was polluted and the honeysuckles had died. Not only were they dead, but they had been trampled to the ground. The branch itself was filled with old bicycles, broken bottles, and garbage. Now, instead of finding something as romantic as an alligator, one would expect to find only rats. The once sweet smelling area now smelled horrible. The stench, which means stink, from my idyllic haven was heart wrenching. Yes, so two paragraphs about the author's memory, one paragraph transition, and two paragraphs about what the author sees today. And then the conclusion. I do not regret having seen my old neighborhood. However, I do not think my innocent childhood memories can ever be the same. I suppose it is true when they say you can never go home again. So the conclusion uh, tries to find some meaning in this comparison. The author had beautiful memories of his childhood. I, I'm guessing he, the author had beautiful memories of childhood. Um, but upon returning, everything looks different. Everything looks worse. And the author says that this has disturbed their memories of childhood. So the conclusion, this is not a good situation, right? When your memories are ruined. So the author tries to find some meaning in this bad situation. And the meaning that he finds is that this is a common experience. It is a universal experience. Everybody has this experience. When you go back to your old home where you lived as a child, you will find that things have changed. And most of the time, things have changed for the worse. And so the way that the essay ends is by reminding us that this is not a big tragedy. This is simply what life is like. So I guess if you really want to say, what does the author want the reader to take away from this essay? Probably that you should remember this is the case. If you ever go back to visit your own childhood home, you will probably face something similar. So like be prepared for something. In fact, as I mentioned, the introduction already gives us this conclusion, right? I sadly realize that the best memories are those left undisturbed. Because once he goes back or once the author goes back, uh, everything has been completely changed. So again, a pretty good structure. Uh, background to like why this essay is written, what is the comparison? And the main idea is already given us here. We don't have to wait for the conclusion. Then two paragraphs, first paragraph on inside the building, second paragraph on outside the building from childhood. Paragraph four switches us to the present day. 
Paragraph five, indoors today. Paragraph six, outdoors today. And then paragraph seven, the conclusion, the meaning, the future. What do you want to give your reader? Very structurally good essay. Questions? So these are four examples of how you can write a comparison contrast essay, and you'll realize that all four examples are taken from something personal in the author's life. It's something that the author is thinking about or feels is important in their life. None of these essays are like topics that the author found on the Internet. If you write about something in your own life that you care about, you will often produce a better essay. Because you, you, you care about it, so you want to get it right. Writing is a very important skill, right? So when you have the chance to practice um, coming up with ideas and putting your ideas on paper, I think it's a good idea to take advantage of that chance and take advantage of the fact that you have someone, me, to give you feedback and help you improve. Once you graduate from here and once you leave school, enter the workplace, it's actually pretty hard to find someone to ask questions about something that is not related to work. After you graduate, if you have English questions, it's not that easy to get an answer. So make the best of this moment. OK, so let's do a grammar practice. No, not that one. No, not that one. Ah, this one. OK, so. In this paragraph. There are. 12 errors. See how many you can find. Give you the. OK, what's going to find out? Uh, and it tells you the kinds of errors that there are. There are five errors in comparison. Four errors of subject verb agreement. And three errors of verb forms. So there are 12. See how many you can find. Um, this kind of question or this kind of problem is not easy. So I will give you 15 minutes to find these 12 errors. And then we will compare answers.
唱的难，还有十三分钟。如果有人抓到十三个的话，我保证你不会被当了。谁要讲的话，应该只有十五个错误了。等一下，一对六，真的。
are you guys still looking? Do you need more time? I'm Alright, I'll give you three more minutes. Okay, let's take a vote. If you caught all 15, please raise your hand. 14. 13. 12. 11. 5. 10. 9. 8. 7. 8. Come on, guys. 7. Did you catch six? Five? Four. How many caught four, four mistakes? OK, great. Come on up. Show us what you found. Come on, come on. Come on. Did you find four? Don't worry. Come on. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. Don't worry. Everyone is very encouraging. So show us what you found. OK, yes, this is a problem. What is the correct word? Better. Yes, good. OK, what else did you find? Uh, let's see. Okay. Is similar to their appreciation for the talent and everything is 
yes, this is a problem. This is wrong. Right? What should be the correct way? OK, yeah, that works is similar. You could also say is similar to T O O. Right? Yeah, OK. Did you find anything else? Yes, this is also a problem. Different ter. This is not a word. What is the correct way? Couldn't be. Uh, here we would say more different. Right. Did you find something else? The differences between. So the question is, how many differences are there, right? Yeah. Is there one difference or many differences? Mm. OK, so what do you think is the one difference? So maybe there's more than one difference. So in this case, is this correct? It's correct. OK, did you find anything else? Indeed, if this is actually correct, you might have been thrown by the insertion of the word indeed. But if you take out the word indeed, it makes more sense. It would be very surprising if an audience. That makes sense, right? Yeah, OK. So I think that's it, right? Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Uh, so let's take a look at all 15 mistakes. Finding mistakes in your own writing is very important. So let's practice together. The first mistake is here. A first time attendee. First time should be linked with a hyphen. Because it's used as one word. A first time attendee. Uh, the second mistake your classmate pointed out, this should be more different. The third mistake is here. It's missing a word. The attire at a classical music concert is as formal as the clothing at a rock concert is informal. As something as something, right? Gun a yang b. So it's missing the word as. The next mistake is here. Behavior is singular, has a dan shu. So this should be is. The next mistake is here. They do not. This should be dance. And therefore, this should be talk. Next mistake your classmate found, this should be better. The next mistake is here. Shouting, pushing, and jumping are three things, not one thing. So it's R common. Next one is here. Begin is not a word. This should be began, A N. The next one here, rock musicians is plural, so this should be point, no S. The next mistake is here, throwed is not a word. The past tense of throw is through, EW. The next mistake is here, Passionate is not a word. This should be less passionate. No R. The next mistake your classmate found, this should be two, T-O-O. In fact, there should be a comma here. If you add T-O-O -O to the end of a sentence, you need a comma. 
blah blah blah. 逗点 T O O. And the final mistake. This one. They simply show it in completely different ways. Questions? So I'm sure once I pointed out the mistake, you knew exactly what was wrong. You just didn't see it until I pointed it out. That is the skill that you should practice. When you when we look for mistakes, try not to pay attention to the meaning of the word. Try to look at the grammar of the word. It's two different ways of reading, right? Even if you don't understand the meaning of the sentence, you can still compare subject and verb. You can still compare like the, the adjective comparison uh, of the word. You can still look at the grammar. So when you're uh, checking your own writing, I advise you to read multiple times. I advise you to check your writing by reading multiple times. The first time you read, read for uh, verbs. Are you using the right verbs? The next time you read, read for subject verb agreement. The next time you read, read for spelling. The next time you read, read for um, prepositions. Right? Read and check one grammar idea every time you check your writing. That way you can practice making your brain focus on the grammar. OK, do you have questions about today? Next week, we're going to read an example essay of comparison contrast that is a bit more complicated and it will take us a bit more time to understand. OK, that's it today. And I will announce how to hand in a late essay on uh, Moodle and Teams, and I will also send an email to your school email.